Okay, look, it's 1504. And let me turn it over right now to Aliona. Thank you, Penny. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin, let me remind you to keep yourself muted during the performance. Once it's over, you're welcome to ask questions. Please raise your hand or submit your question in the chat. Today, in a collaboration with, between the Tompkins Square and Hudson Park Libraries, we are presenting a very special event with international performance star Penny Arcade, drawing from her memoir and the oral history that she and her longtime collaborator, Steele Zehentner, have been creating since 1999, the Lower East Side Biography Project, a labor of love that broadcasts and streams weekly. Today, Penny will share selections from her personal history and life illustrated by videos from some of the many fascinating personalities in the Lower East Side Biography Project. Please welcome Penny Arcade. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited. You know, hey. I'm like most people, you know, I'm, I don't like to work unless somebody, you know, approaches me with something and then I like, come up with a fast idea. And um, sometimes those fast ideas really turn into something that, uh, as we say in the theater, has legs. And I realized that this project that I'm doing because of Aliona, uh, like it gave me an idea that I'd had in the past. In 2003, I did a performance in Leipzig, Germany called My Life is History. And I was just starting to, um, it, it came into my mind and the woman, I don't remember her name anymore, I'm sorry. The woman who had brought me to Leipzig um, came and decided to interview me like 10 minutes before I went on. And I was like, you know, you, you, you can't do this. I'm, I'm getting ready to go on stage. I can't, you know, have an interview. And she said, well, you know, how can you call this my life is history? You're only 53 years old. You haven't lived your whole life. And I looked at her and I said, how old are you? And she was like 42 or something. And I said, well, you know, when you're 53, you pretty much know certain things about your life. Like I know I'm never gonna be a mother. I know I'm never gonna go to medical school. You know, certain things are already defined in your life. So. This is wonderful because it allows me to combine um, an understanding of myself. You know, I think all of us, as we get older, that we wonder how we became who we are. And, um, and I think this is a part of the last stage of life, which is the completion of character, which, you know, this is like everybody always talks about, you know, like, especially now there's so much ageism and there's so much, you know, stuff on like, you know, emerging artists, like everybody who's young, they are the smartest, the coolest, the people with the most to say, which is, you know, we all know is kind of stupid, right? Because I mean, obviously you must get better at things and at life and, and you must become more wise with the experience of life. So I'm gonna start with my life as history part one. I have lived on New York's Lower East Side longer than I've lived anywhere else. At the age of 17 in 1967, I washed up on the shores of what had just started to be called the East Village in order to attract college students away from Greenwich Village by the much lower rents. With the exception of my life between the ages of 21 and 31, when I lived in Amsterdam, Formentera and Mallorca in Spain's Balearic Islands, and then in the backwoods of Maine and in a fishing island called um, Oars Island and Bodenham in central Maine, downtown New York, particularly the Lower East Side, has been my beat. I was born into an immigrant Southern Italian family, the first child of two vastly different people from vastly different backgrounds. My mother, Antonetta, was the only child of poor sharecroppers in the rugged mountains of Basilicata, the Appalachia of Italy, right above the instep of the boot. Her father, Giuseppe, was an itinerant basket weaver. He 
went from farmhouse to farmhouse and wove baskets. My, um, her mother, Agata, along with her sister, Felicia, worked uh, the large iron looms called Utalari, and she was a weaver of cloth. But from the age of eight, my mother had been brought up very properly in a Protestant boarding school slash orphanage in a Bourbon manor house in view of the Mediterranean Ocean, surrounded by orange groves in the royal city of Portici outside of Naples. But how she got there is a much longer story than I can tell today. My father, Vittorio, was the youngest son of Gian Battista Ventura, the captain of the port of Savona, a city of great sophistication in Liguria, close to Genoa. His mother, Assunta, for whom I am named, was from Porto Empedocle in Western Sicily, the home of playwright Pirandello. No doubt they met when my paternal grandfather was the captain of one of Sicily's ports, Marsala being one of the places he captained. My father was 14 to 15 years younger than his two brothers, Gianni and Nicola, both of whom escaped their supposedly tyrannical father as teenagers and migrated to the USA, both of them setting themselves up in the large Italian immigrant community in Greenwich Village on Thompson Street. How my father and mother met is an outrageous story I cannot tell here today, but it happened on the high seas. Look, I'm wearing my anchor because my father was a sailor and I'm the daughter of the sea. Oh, that's cool. Um, my mother was returning to Italy at the age of 32 to visit her mother, and my father was being deported from America, from American soil, on the same boat. I have all the photographs of their unfolding romance aboard the ship. After a short courtship, they married in Italy in the Cathedral of Pompeii, which is the church of sailors and seafaring folks, or as my mother put it, in the 1990s, when I asked her about it, she said, hey, 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 what do you think? It was like Las Vegas. After they wed, my mother returned to New Britain, Connecticut, where she had been living with her father. And my father, Vittorio, joined her a few months later. Was it a coincidence that I ended up in the East Village, the Lower East Side, a neighborhood dominated by Russian Jews, Poles, and Ukrainians? and Lithuanians. I had come from New Britain, Connecticut, often referred to as New Britsky because of the dominant Polish and Eastern European population of Lithuanians, Ukrainians, and other Eastern Europeans. It's probably not a coincidence. My first awareness of the counterculture came to me in 1966 while I was still in Connecticut in the form of an unusual rock and roll record. The smartest kids in my hometown spent their evenings listening to us, listening in certain basement rec recreation rooms to a hairy group of New York beat era musicians and poets called the Fugs. The opposite of the Beatles was not the Rolling Stones, but the Fugs. And through them, I discovered the existence of the underground and the utility of a life of the mind, of art, satire, philosophy, as well as anarchism, anti-death penalty, and the anti-war movement. Very soon after my arrival in 1967, while standing on the corner of Avenue A and 10th Street, not far from the Tompkins Square Public Library. I looked across the street and I saw the Fugs founders, the poets Ed Sanders and Thule Kupferberg. They were standing outside of Ed Sanders' Peaceye bookstore. I recognized them from the album cover. I was too timid and shy to approach them, but the fact of their existence became a guiding light. In 1967, Thule Kupferberg was 44 years old. We knew that the expression, don't trust anyone over 30, was coined by people who were over 30 themselves. In 1994, when I myself was 44 years old, 
Thule Kupferberg approached me at the Poetry Project, enthusiastic about my work. He was then 71 years old, the age I am now about to become. This was the beginning of our friendship. That I became friends with Thule is a fact that still amazes me. Thule Kupferberg was a great satirist and intellect. He was the quintessential Bohemian spirit filled with the joie de vivre, the joy of living, pre-beatnik, noble, whimsical, forever young, youth being a quality that has nothing to do with age. Thule was the perfect example of someone who lived art with his many cartoons and self-published books. He signed his 2000 uh, AD book, Teach Yourself Fucking, to me. He signed it to Penny, You Can Teach Others, which made me laugh hysterically. He was proof that anarchy is an optimistic movement. As he once said, no one who lived through the 1950s could have ever imagined the 1960s were possible. So there is always hope. So now from the Lower East Side Biography Project, please meet Thule Kupferberg. When did the FUGS get started? Uh, they started in uh, 64, 65. There was uh, Ed, myself, Ken Weaver. There were two junkies. They were the only ones who played any kind of instrument. There was a place called the Metro where everyone went that was sort of uh, pivotal in, uh, in the poetry community. Everybody would read there. Uh, Metro was between 9th and 10th Street, I think, on 2nd Avenue. I met Ed Sanders at the um, poetry readings. After the poetry readings, we would go around the corner to St. Mark's Place, and there was a, a place called the the Dumb. Downstairs, there was a bar that was a local bar for Poles. And they had jukeboxes there, and the jukeboxes would play, they installed them, would play the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And one day, Ed said, uh, we can do that too. You know, we can do better than that. And we could do better, we, anyone could do better than the early Beatles songs. So let's form a band. I said, great. I picked the name from uh, Norman Mailer's book, The Naked and the Dead. Have you read that? He uses the word fug all the time instead of fuck. I think this is true. He had used fuck in the manuscript, and the publishers uh, sort of changed it. And um, when we first advertised in the Post and got the word fug when we were at the Players Theater in the paper, that was a great victory. We started to play in. Um, we were terrible musicians, but we wrote a lot of songs. And uh, our first uh, gig was in uh, Ed Sanders' bookstore on East 10th Street, the uh, Peace Eye. There was a woman there from Time Magazine. And she ran the uh, house, the little house pillar, and she thought we were great. And I don't know, we became an instantaneous uh, phenomenon. Born on Lower East Side, right? Yeah. Where? On a street that doesn't exist anymore, Cannon Street, with two ends. Well, we moved to Brooklyn when my father had uh, ran uh, three unsuccessful uh, retail stores. Well, then we moved to Manhattan. It was working class neighborhood. Right. It was East Seventy Second Street. My first uh, education was uh, when my uh, mother flung open the ice box and pointed to my father and said. There's, look, there's no food. When are, we, <laughs> when are we going to get some money? And my father didn't really have the answer to that. He had, he had a store that was failing. He worked in a, a men's factory, a, a men's clothing factory the rest of his life as a machine operator. I, I started high school in Manhattan. It's sort of an interesting, uh, terrible episode in my life. I went to Townsend Harris, which was for smart boys. There was a math, the math class was run by, this was the Depression, by a guy with a doctorate, you know, it was high school. 
And when I went to the board and I had to do a math, I had to do a math problem, and he would say they would call it master. Um, he would say, Master Kupferberg, two zeros. You could get a zero for getting it wrong and for having the the form wrong. You're supposed to put your name and so on. I said, Holy shit! I'm going to a school where you can get two zeros for one one event. This is not for me. I passed through New Utrecht High School, which was. Uh, it boasted that it was the large, or second largest high school in the world. And, and uh, it was a period of the Spanish Civil War, and there were incredible, everyone was a communist. The students, the teachers. So it was a very f sort of, it was free, a, freer in other ways, I think. That, and, I, and I also was uh, intensely political. There were uh, separate tables in the, in the uh, lunchroom for uh, Stalinists and Trotskyites and uh, unaffiliated, well, the unaffiliated, I sort of hung out at the Trotsky unaffiliated. Were people intensely political because they were all immigrant children? Well, it was the Depression, and uh, uh, the U.S. didn't get out of the, the, the war saved American, uh, the American economy. So it was the Depression. If you weren't for, for social change, you were an idiot. During the Depression, right, most American artists, writers, I would say, I would guess, guess that 80% of them were uh, communists or communist sympathizers. Most artists were uh, radicalized by the depression. Hi, so I realized that I made a little bit of an error in not explaining the Lower East Side biography project to those of you who may not be familiar with it. So in 1999, Steve Zettner, my longtime collaborator, we're now entering into our 30th year of working together. Um, he and I uh, were, I was approached by Rick Youngers, who is a public access television activist who worked for Manhattan Neighborhood Network uh, to do a public access TV project. And I didn't really kind of, you know, I didn't warm up to it right away. Uh, but then I realized that this project that they were offering me would be a way uh, to train other artists, people of kind of my ilk in video. And I had been using video in my work since 1988, I think, 89, I started using live video in my work. And I thought this was a great idea. So of course I approached several people who I knew who made their own work the way I did. And I said, hey, you know, you can be part of this project and you can learn how to do video and you can use video in your work and you can document your work. And most people didn't document their work. Not one of them wanted to do it. I was so stunned. And there were a lot of young people who wanted to learn how to do video and it was expensive to learn. So Steve and I created a training program. And the only thing that was required of us was to have some 30 minute programs to put on, uh, on public television, on public access, because they were looking for a way to like lift the content of public television by having artists participate. So, you know, Steve and I hit it running. And they gave us very little money, but it was enough money to buy a camera. And um, we started out with 10 or 12 or 15 people that we trained. And it was very exciting. It was, um, we were, you know, I was 49 years old. I was almost 50 years old. And we were involved with a lot of young people. Steve, of course, is 12 years younger than me. And we just started to go out and, interview people because people were disappearing. And at that time in 1999, <clears throat> oral history by people who weren't like the famous person of the moment. <clears throat> in other words, it was okay to interview, say, Allen Ginsberg about the beat movement, but you couldn't interview somebody who had just been a witness to it. And um, I think that one of the things that Steve and I both felt was that we wanted to interview the witnesses. You know, when we could interview somebody who was a major player, that was great too. 
but you found out the truth about an era by interviewing all the people who had been witnessing it. So you can watch it in New York or you can watch it online. Every Monday at 11 p.m., we're still interviewing people. The last person that we interviewed in person was just a couple of weeks ago, um, the writer um, and uh, publisher, Chris Krause from Semiotext. You know, she became quite famous with her book, I Love Dick, which was made into a Netflix special or an Amazon special, I can't remember which it was. And then a year before on March 12th, just before the lockdown, we interviewed the great writer and playwright, uh, Kenneth Brown, who wrote The Brig and um, some really phenomenal uh, novels, many of which are no longer published, but should be. So now that I've explained all of that to you, I will add that you can go, if you're not part of our Patreon, which anyone can join our Patreon for as little as $2. You can, you know, it, you can join monthly or you can make a one-time donation. It's part of our dignity for all. Everyone can get in there and have access to many of our Lower East Side Biography Project interviews, the full interviews that are 28 minutes long. Some we have are even longer, which are raw. And then you also get to see all my work and you also get to see all of the live events that we do. So now that I've told you that, I will continue. So like most teen runaways in 1967, I spent every day on the move from wherever I found a bed for the night to spending part of each day walking from Avenue D or C or B to Tompkins Square Parks and across St. Mark's to Christopher Street, then to the Hudson River and then back around by way of Washington Square Park and the undisputed crossroads of the counterculture in 1967 was in front of Gem Spa, the candy and newspaper stand at the corner of St. Mark's and Second Avenue, which closed last year, partially because of COVID and partially because of the gentrification, the unbridled gentrification and greed of the landlord. So that was a huge shock to many of us. And um, I would be there at Gem Spa without even being aware of it. I would be meeting the larger than life artists and poets who would come to define my lineage, my artistic lineage. St. Mark's Place like Bleecker and McDougal Street and Greenwich Village before it became the four corners where people of all persuasion met. It's the first place that travelers stopped to pick up on the news and to run in into people that they already knew or to meet new people. It was busy at all hours of the day and night and I spent part of every day observing perch on one of the parking meters directly in front of Gem Spa. And one of the very first people that I would come to know in New York was another 17 year old, David Johansson, who journeyed to this corner from his parents' house on Staten Island, each of us twirling on our parking meter observing the passing parade of people, unaware that we were dreaming our future. For those of you who don't know who David Johansson is, David Johansson would go on to form the New York Dolls and then later Buster Point Dexter. And right now Martin Scorsese is in the middle of making a documentary about David that you'll probably all see somewhere in the near future. So it was into that great teenage diaspora of the late 1960s that teenagers from all over America and the world showed up on that corner amid older New Yorkers who I would eventually come to know, poets and artists who made the daily pilgrimage to Gem Spa, like the poet Ted Berrigan, filmmaker Jack Smith, the poets Allen Ginsberg and Jonas Meckes, and the most charismatic of them all, the poet and original performance artist, Taylor Mead.
By the time I met Taylor Mead in 1967, he was already firmly established as the preeminent comedic actor in underground films, beginning with his inspired performance in Ron Rice's 1960 film, The Flower Thief. And he is widely considered the first underground film star by no less than film critic historian Jay Hoberman. And soon after he became a Warhol superstar, featured in many of Warhol's movies. Taylor would magically appear in front of Gem Spa, twirling and camping, spouting improvised bits of poetry while turning his transistor radio up and down to make a found soundscape. I would drop whoever I was talking to and secretly fall in behind Taylor as he danced down the street, mesmerized by his charisma and courage his transistor radio glued to his ear as he parted the crowds, unfazed by catcalls, a holy fool. It wasn't long before I realized that Taylor noticed me. And while we spoke only with our eyes, it was clear that he wanted to be followed, a beat Arab Pied Piper and I, his lone follower, the witness to his moving performance piece. One day, I worked up the nerve to ask him if I could listen to his radio. No, he laughed out loud, turning on his heel and pausing to collect a group of people, he continued, you can't listen to my radio. And he looked wildly around, his eyeballs juggling as he pulled in the attention of the people passing by into an improvised audience like a carnival barker. Assured of the crowd's focus, he crowed, I'm sorry, you can't listen to my radio because my radio only likes me listening to it. At first I was embarrassed, interpreting his line as a slap down of rejection. But when everyone laughed, I understood quickly that the crowd wasn't laughing at me. Instead, I realized that he had included me in a short two person play. I was part of it. I wondered how did he do that? In the 1990s, when Taylor and I had been friends for, oh, close to 30 years, I reminded him that I used to follow him in the street and he remembered. Then I reminded him of the story with the transistor radio. Oh, he laughed. That became one of my best lines. But for the first time I said it, it was to you. So it's my pleasure right now to introduce you to Taylor Mead. Where do you buy love? Give me the address, quick. <laughs> I'll get the money somehow. I'll write home for extra money to buy love. I'll say I'm in trouble and need $100. But even then, they might not send it. Oh, God, I'll have to work to make money to, to, to buy love. To hell with it. Bernard Shaw was my first release from uh, slavery of the 1940s and of a family. He wrote a great preface called Parents and Children, which was about the English upper classes, but it applied to boarding schools here in New York and everything. And he wrote a devastating article. That, that was a tremendous opening. Please. Just because you have an opium head for a son, there's no reason to put insecticide on the poppies. <laughs> Give us a thumbnail sketch of life in New York in the 40s and the 50s, because, you know, we always hear about life. The 40s was, uh, the 40s, unfortunately, the police uh, were entrapping people. I got entrapped a couple of times, wound up in jail. I used to carry a razor so I could slit my wrist, because the tombs in New York, one of the most psychologically devastating prisons in the world. You know, a few hours there, uh, you'll confess to anything to get out. And, uh, but, but otherwise it had, the, the great village was a whole mixture of writers, uh, musicians, everything. There was no women's liberation, gay liberation. You could go to the Oak Bar at the plaza and no women were allowed. It was all us men. <laughs> It segued, the 40s into the 50s wasn't that big a deal. The 50s into the 60s was a very big schizo 
Excuse me. If your hair was slightly over your ears, you'd get arrested. People would yell, get a haircut. It was so square, the 50s. I lived in the West Village, and it was very bohemian. It was a one, and then gay liberation came along, and it became just plain gay. Everyone in combat boots and mustaches, all lookalikes. All the bars became very homogenized, uh, and the, the and the gay people started trying to suppress freedom of speech, just like the women's liberation did at first. And now they both relaxed, and. Uh, so the bohemian thing went out. The variety went out. Do you the variety now is down here in the Lower East Side. But do you think it's bohemian? The, the Lower East Side, it's, well, bohemian is sort of an old-fashioned word. It's, uh, it's just uh, amalgamanian. <laughs> well, unfortunately for that poetry thing, that that got me out of being too inverted. I was really, in fact, I was suicidal from the time I was nine years old, extremely. I would have killed myself, but I found a friend hanging in his room and that burned it out on me. <laughs> in New York, it was the, the epitome, it's where I blossomed in the late 50s, run by the artist, uh, famous artist Larry Poons, who used to read with a toilet seat around his neck. And uh, then there was the McDougal Cafe with this great proprietor. When the police tried to close it because of our, some of our poetry was pretty raunchy and four-letter words and everything, and we were cursing society and, and uh, attacking everything that existed, and the police wanted to close us. And the proprietor, whose name I wish I could think of because he's a real hero, he would sit there with a shotgun. He said, You're not closing me down. And, and, uh, I think New York respected its nutcases more than they do now. So we stayed in business, and then Bill Cosby and Woody Allen, and the, but Bill Cosby and Woody Allen were trying to please the audiences. We were trying to insult them, and the boombox, I was the first boombox person in New York, only I was very discreet. In the early days of FM in the 50s, the FM stations had to keep going, and they had, didn't have ads, and they weren't that commercial then. They played music all day. So I'd listen 12, 15 hours a day. I'd listen to uh, music, jazz, classical, pop, everything. I've made three films a year since 1959 or 60. That's a hundred and some films. I average, you know, my career never doesn't go up and down. It just goes... <laughs> So wasn't that wonderful? God, Taylor, I miss him so much. Um, in the 1960s, the greatest performances were to be had on the streets of New York. Being young in the East Village in the 1960s meant that the people who defined my perception of New York were public people. People who acted out their individuality in the great streets and public parks of New York in the late 60s, and it was a time of political demonstrations against the war in Vietnam. And while at 17, I was yet to acquire a political perspective or political analysis, I understood what the body bags coming from Vietnam on the nightly news meant. And I gathered with the great wave of humanity of all ages that attended the public demonstrations to end the war. One of the first things that impressed me was the wide range of ages at these demonstrations. The intergenerationalism was important. In December of 1967, I was arrested with 264 other people at the Whitehall Street Induction Center, demonstrating against the draft. We had marched down from the East Village, a ragtag army of hippie kids, led by Galahad and Groovy, who ran a series of crash pads for young runaways. The night before the demo, I crashed there because the plan was to march downtown and arrive by 5 a.m. at the induction center, which uh, opened at uh, 5.30 in the morning. And there were probably about a thousand of us marching downtown 
led by Dr. Benjamin Spock and the poet Allen Ginsberg, we kind of merged into this, in, in, into this large group of people. And eventually the demonstration when we got down to uh, Whitehall Street was around 2,500 people. And I watched Allen Ginsberg try to jump over the barricade holding his little finger, finger symbols. And I got the message and being 24 years younger and agile, I catapulted over the police barrier. And I was arrested with 264 other demonstrators, 171 men and 93 women. I was surrounded by people of every age in jail, but the person who stood out to me was a very old lady with glasses and white hair pulled under a black watch camp. To my 17 year old eyes, she looked so old. It turns out that she was Dorothy Day from the Catholic Worker. She was 70 years old then, my exact age today. And it would be years before I learned her remarkable story. Dorothy Day was a journalist and an anarchist who eventually preached liberation theology after living a wild bohemian youth of free love and social action, she had had an abortion, she had a child out of wedlock, but she became a Catholic leader without abandoning her social and anarchist activism. Quite a remarkable person. And one person who combined art and politics and was close to Dorothy Day was the charismatic co-founder of the Living Theater, Judith Molina. Shortly before Judith's death, um, she was asked by the Catholic Church to attest to what could be considered a miracle by Dorothy Day, who is being beatified. As we speak, Dorothy Day is on the um, conveyor belt of sainthood in the Catholic Church, which is amazing given that it's publicly known that she had had an abortion and that she had a child out of wedlock, all the things that the Catholic Church, you know, can't stand. Um, and so the miracle that Judith told was the story of sharing a jail cell for 30 days with Dorothy Day at the Women's House of Detention. And the miracle Judith witnessed was that not one of the junkies, street prostitutes or hardened criminals in the women's house of detention would swear or fight in the presence of Dorothy Day's holiness. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to the great Judith Molina. Here we go. I keep hearing this outcry. It tells me to get going and do something useful. In my, you know, you know, the story of Avilokiteshvaran, who is, he's the eternal Buddha. He's the one who, having gone through all the stages toward Buddhahood, comes to the gates of Nirvana, and hears the outcry of human suffering. And he said, I will not go into Nirvana until everybody else is redeemed, and I will close the door behind me. So I have this ringing in my ear all the time that I'm supposed to be doing something about all these problems. Dorothy Day in the jail cell who has constantly reproached me. And she says, why are you trying to solve everybody's problem? I said, well, why shouldn't I be? She said, because you can't solve everybody's problem. I said, Dorothy, I know this, but that's no reason for the not trying. I think you have to go to demonstrations in a certain sense as a peacemaker. It's important to create an activist, forceful, impactful demonstration that doesn't necessarily provoke the police. I used to have a boyfriend in the old days when I used to go downtown and get beat up all the time, who said to me, look, Melina, going downtown and getting some nice quiet cop to beat you up is not nonviolence and you gotta be a peacemaker all the time. You gotta be the, among the people that are gonna try to prevent the violence because the violence promotes more violence and of course in our philosophy doesn't help. To have an artistic life is to find your affinity group 
in New York, you have the worst and the best. You can find anything here. Uh, uh, find the best. Uh, look for it. And then, as Shakespeare says, bind it to you with hoops of steel. Uh, uh, find what you really want to do with the people you really want to do it with. And don't waste your time on a lot of the dross that's around. It's fine if you want to do that, if you want to waste yourself. But if you want to use yourself optimally, find other people that are, that are on your wavelength and, and create with them a, a, a movement. What were you feeling in the 60s when the re revolution really seemed to be occurring? Uh, very optimistic. We hoped it might happen. Uh, we weren't prepared. Uh, uh, the next thing was the blow of understanding that we had to prepare now. How do we prepare for that? Every minute of our life, by getting rid of all the hate, by getting rid of all the anger, by getting rid of all the, the tense tightness of our isolation, by reaching out to each other, by being good to each other. Einstein pointed that out, that we're really, each of us, the center of the universe. Everything revolves around each of us. And how much we sense ourselves in that way, and how much we can use ourselves to be useful, to be there in the middle. That's, that's, maybe that's the great achievement. Yeah. The hard part is, from the 60s to the zeros, shall we say, what do you call it? The zeros? Zeros. To the zeros, yes, this is the hard part. Because the hard part's always gonna be the next step anyhow. You know, what's happening now? Where are we? And what can we draw from all this historical mishmash or historical analysis of where it went from here to there and how we got from there to here and what the sources and the influences were and what Paul Goodman did and what Dorothy Day did and what Erwin Piscotter did. What do we do now? That's really what I want to know. And that's what I want the people that, that, that hear me say this uh, to think about. And if you find out, tell me. What should we do now? How would you like to be remembered? Remembered? Uh, as the instigator of the beautiful nonviolent anarchist revolution. Oh my God, it's so beautiful to see Judith. And Judith said a remarkable thing to me, which is really interesting because, you know, people, especially right now, we hear so much about anarchists, they call everybody anarchists. Well, there's, you know, more than one kind of anarchist, right? Um, there's the Bakunin, blow everything up anarchist. And then there's the beautiful, peaceful, nonviolent anarchist like Judith. And she said, um, I am an anarchist because I'm an optimist. Because she believed that things could change, that the world could be better. So it's just very exciting to, I miss Judith a lot. It's just wonderful to see her. And, you know, you can go to our Lower East Side Biography Project uh, and you can watch the whole interview with Judith. Um, we will be putting on, uh, Steve had a great idea, which was to, uh, on our Patreon, we're putting a lot of uh, unedited interviews. So the, you know, we usually interview somebody for two or three hours, you know, so. It's so interesting. I mean, I really wish that, you know, you know, ultimately I'm a poet <clears throat> and I go where the day takes me. I'm not that person who, you know, uh, and, and neither is Steve, oddly enough. I mean, both of us were the same. It's not like we have this amazing video project that we've been doing for 20 years that broadcasts every week, broadcasts every week for 20 years. You'd think we would have gone to the Ford Foundation or we'd go somewhere that would give us money 
you know, to, to do this where we could pay our rent and pay our expenses and do this wonderful work. Now we do it as a labor of love. What can you do? Um, now, in his brilliant novel, The Power and the Glory, the British author Graham Greene wrote, there is always one moment in childhood when the door opens and lets the future in. And I have this cut out of a magazine or a newspaper on my door, on my door. I have two things on my door. I have three things on my door. I have that on my door. I have, um, I got involved with my neighbor's problems on my door to remind me not to do that again. And then I have um, a photo uh, card from the documentary on the great Paul Goodman, which uh, Judith just spoke of Paul Goodman. And we have, um, have had the luck of doing an interview with, um, uh, uh, I'm not gonna remember his name, Azari. Um, you know, the, the great Paul Goodman was a major influence on the 60s. I mean, there was a time when college students, their hero, you know, was Paul Goodman. And it was an extraordinary, um, uh, he was a sociologist and he also formed a school on Lower East Side with the children of Puerto Rican and Dominicans. Anyway, um, we will at some point bring that in because that was a huge, Paul Goodman was a huge influence on me without my even knowing who Paul Goodman was because these ideas in the 60s were in the air. So to continue with what I'm actually about to tell you, at 17, a door to my future opened in the form of theater director, John Vaccaro founder of the Playhouse of the Ridiculous, the man who brought glitter glam and rock and roll theater to the world. A powerful theatrical visionary, Vaccaro was brilliant, mercurial, and cruel. The first theater director to put a rock and roll band on stage, he influenced the creation of the musical hair. And in one way or other, everything that came afterwards from Rocky Horror to punk rock, he was born into a devout Catholic immigrant family in Steubenville, Ohio. By 18, Bakar was confused by a Roman Catholic upbringing, as he put it, in a town with nine blocks of whorehouses. John joined the Navy after high school, then took a year off to travel the world, and he steeped himself in kabuki theater in Japan. He began his performance career as a stand-up comedian on the campus of Ohio State University. And after a mental breakdown, landed him in a mental hospital for two years, he arrived in New York City and began to work as a rare book appraiser by day and eventually started to work with both Jack Smith in live performances as well as films and with the Poets Theater with Leroy Jones, later known as Amira Baraka and Diane de Prima. The motto of the Playhouse of the Ridiculous this, these days often attributed to the playwright Ronnie Tavell, with whom Vaccaro staged early plays that had been written by Tavell originally as film scripts for Andy Warhol. Yet having heard this motto from 1967 on and knowing both men, it really leads me to believe that Tavell and Vaccaro had different versions of the same manifesto. This is the one I grew up hearing with Vaccaro. We have gone beyond the absurd. Our position is absolutely ridiculous. When you hear Tavell's, it's, we have gone beyond the absurd. Our position is absolutely preposterous. You know, we actually have in our Lower East Side Biography Project archive, a interview in 1989 or 90 with Ronnie Tavell that I did by myself. This is like a year before I met Steve Zettner. I have an interview that I did with Ronnie Tavell in New Orleans. So we have to look at that, look for that. Steve, make a note. Okay, so um, in the late 1960s in New York, there were two scenes in downtown New York. 
One scene was around Vaccaro and the other one was around Andy Warhol. And a few of us like me worked with both. But the Warhol films lacked any kind of structure and they were no match artistically for the controlled chaos of the Playhouse of the Ridiculous. Vaccaro plays had 30 people on stage, almost all of them untrained artists, actors. Um, we would often, um, what is that? We'd often improvise around Vaccaro's ideas rather than a script with Vaccaro giving us long lectures on philosophy, history and literature as we rehearsed for two or three hours a night for months. It was not a theater company. The Playhouse of the Ridiculous was a way of life. As Vaccaro told Q Magazine in 1970, my people are like what they do on stage in real life. Few of them are different. They're not actors. Few of them had any training. And with those that did have training, I had to destroy their grammar school ideas of acting. What we're, what we're doing, I really couldn't tell you. How it works between us, I don't know. I say things and they do them, but it doesn't stop there. I give a detail and they build up a whole history behind the detail. Watch one of the shows three or four times and you'll see it. In part, Andy Warhol attempted to bring some of the performance quality of the Playhouse to his films by employing Playhouse stars like Jackie Curtis and myself. Since there were no scripts in an Andy Warhol movie, actors who could improvise were imperative. Andy made it very clear to me when he asked me to be in his films. Andy said, I wanna work with people who can perform like you, who are out there, but not crazy. People who can deliver a performance. John Vaccaro held the curtain for me and I saw and I believed. He was a very hard taskmaster and he did a fair amount of emotional damage to me. Yet what he actually did, when I think about it now at age 70, was he went into wounds I already had. He didn't give me new wounds. He just had this way, this, he had this radar that he just knew where you were damaged and he would go in there all the way into you. So I would say that while my life with him was difficult, it gave me the opportunity to heal those original wounds. Without that authentic healing, character completion is impossible. So let me introduce you to John Vaccaro. I knew I had to be here. I think from the time I was uh, very young, I had to be in New York. New York was exciting. It was, everything was happening here. And I think that's what it is now. I wanted to be an artist. God, I wanted to be an artist. Because I didn't think I could be anything else. I, don't, I could never have been a lawyer. Never. Or a doctor. No, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be around artists. I liked talking to, or I liked the conversations. There was a, a great feeling. There was a wonderful feeling of, of, firstly, there was a great camaraderie. There was no particular bar we went to. We didn't go to bars. That was not what we did. We went to visit each other. And everybody seemed, everybody came to my place. Everybody. Plus, at one point, and we were always doing something too. We were, we were not just sitting still, we were doing something. We smoked a whole lot of grass. It was grass time. <laughs> and uh, people, I had a loft and uh, it was, it happened to be midway between what they call now the East Village and the village. And it was sort of uh, uh, this limbo in between and people always stopped. And everybody would bring it, you know. We sat around all night long talking, listening to music.
And they were very, uh, they, almost everybody became famous. They were painters, they were poets, they were musicians. Actors, please, I wouldn't allow those cocksuckers to come near me. I didn't want an actor. I wanted a performer. <laughs> well, the people that I met, we shaped each other's lives a whole lot, a whole lot. You know, we were discovering various truths about ourselves. I think we had to eliminate a lot of the lies. I remember I used to say that. Most people lie in their beds. I like the truth in mine. <laughs> so, you know, no, no matter how silly the script and, uh, and, and that, I always said that the height of drama has always been, per se, uh, Shakespeare. And the height of drama was always man versus himself. Hamlet, King Lear, and of course the other playwrights like uh, Arthur Miller with Willie Loman and that type of man versus himself. And I said, I wasn't interested in that. I was more interested in the world versus itself. I didn't give a shit about man. Eat, you eat, you don't eat, that's too bad. You should eat. You have to eat if you're going to live. You got to figure it out. That's why I get very upset when I see people that... I'm very upset about that there is so much deprivation in the world. But, I mean, and, you know, like we said yesterday, you know, you read the New York Times, as I was reading it today, going through page after page, and I don't read every article, but I read some, but I get the headlines and that. It's so medieval. We've never gone past... We're still in the dark ages. It's scary, the amount of ugliness in the world. What are you afraid of happening? Well, at this point in my life, <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. But uh, it's over. <laughs> I think we're we're doing ourselves in anyway. Ozone, poke a window in the ozone, poke a hole in the ozone, let the ultraviolet rays shine through, burn you, oh cancer, cancer is the answer to the question of starvation and overpopulation. Oh, 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 ozone. Poke a window in the ozone. Poke a hole in the ozone. Let the ultraviolet rays shine through. The blue burn you. Oh my God, it's so incredible to see John and to miss John. So the nexus of community in the East Village was poetry, theater, film, music, and art. And throughout my youth, my 20s, when I was less aware of it, and in my 30s and 40s, when I became really conscious of it, the poet and filmmaker Jonas Meckes was always omnipresent. He was like the sky. In my 42nd year, I became friends with Jonas Meckes at the same time as I became friends with my poet hero, John Giorno. These two remarkable men shared much in common. They were both poets, both grand collaborators with people and artists of all ages. They both not only developed themselves, but created entire communities around themselves. Since I only have time to introduce you to one this time, I will choose Jonas Meckes because he was older. Jonas Meckes was born in Lithuania and after years of war, landed in New York in 1950, the year I was born. 
He is widely considered the father of experimental film and personal cinema, but above all, he defined himself as a poet, which I resonate with completely. Um, despite the fact that I've lived my life in the theater, I am first and foremost a poet. From both John Giorno and Jonas, I learned the true meaning of a lifelong practice in the arts. As John Giorno said, thank you for allowing me to be a poet, a noble effort, doomed, but the only choice. That's from the poem, Thanks for Nothing. By the way, you can go and see some of John Giorno's amazing um, text fragments that um, he made into giant paintings. They're at Speroni Whitewater, wait a minute, no, Westwater. Speroni Westwater Gallery on um, Bowery between um, East Houston and Prince Street on the um, downtown side of the street. Go and see them. It's a small show, but it, it's very, very beautiful. So let me see where I am. So in the future, I'll look forward to sharing our interview, Lower East Side Biography interview with John Giorno. But for right now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the one and only Jonas Meckes. The term artist these days and for many, many, many years and decades I, I never used and I try not to use and I, I am very suspicious. It's like George Machunas of the Fluxus, uh, you know, when uh, he started Soho, when somebody used to come you know, to him to join the cooperative, one of those cooperatives that he was setting, just, so what do you do? And if somebody says, Oh, I am an artist. And he immediately said, you paid double. <laughs> That's how he used to punish those who considered themselves artists. <laughs> you paid double. You're an artist, really? You, you paid double. I, I, I jump when I hear one, you know, artist. Uh, artist maybe is less than creative. That's the one that makes me crazy. Creative. It's creative people who destroy everything that I like. Creative, good bread and good wine and good food because they don't like anything that has been established for thousands of years and it's good and makes you healthy and strong. They want to try different and they destroy everything. See, creativity, creative. And people who have ideas, that's not, I, that's, I would ban all those people somewhere. Or, or designers, designers, oh, mamma mia. Uh, of course, they're the workers, you know. I, I wrote once a manifesto, uh, anti-worker manifesto, because workers is a new invention. You know, when you're a farmer, you do, you do get up, the sun is going to come up soon, you get up, you, you know, take care of cattle, or, you do what has to be done. You're not a worker. You just do. You're part of what has to be done, you see, of life. And later the worker comes in and they are responsible and they don't care what they do. They will make, you know, the needles to, 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 to torture people, to squeeze under your nails. They will do everything for money. Workers. I hate workers because they do everything for money. They don't love what they're doing. Another thing I hate, retirement. Retire. Huh? Well, no, he's retired. You know, it means if one retires, that means what one, that work that one was doing, he did not care about his work. He was just a worker. Yes, workers retire. Those who love what they're doing, they never retire. They just die doing what they're doing. Like this sculptor in, in, in Lithuania, he died carrying a stone. That is life. That's what I like. It's, I used to say that it's very seldom that I cross 34th Street. Then the time came, so I, it's very seldom that I cross uh, 14th Street. Then uh, two years ago, we went and uh, we went to St. Mark's um, Church for some poetry reading. So let's have a beer. We go to a bar on 2nd uh, uh, Avenue and like 9th Street. 
and and this is, is what? And, and this is like uptown. So, no, I'm not crossing Eighth Street anymore. Now suppose I have to be the uh, mayor or the chief of the police in New York. If anybody would offer me, uh, I don't know how much money, I wouldn't take it. It is difficult. I mean, very difficult. Uh, uh, to be a, a policeman or chief of the police in New York, because people are bad. You see, cinema is good. Wine is good, cinema is good. These are two things. If you were mayor of New York, what would you do? What would be your first action? I would um, exile all designers. <laughs> <laughs> Those who call themselves designers, they are ruining my image, Im images of the, that I see. They, they're clattering my vision with, with, with the ugliest possible things. Uh, okay. I would then uh, uh, ban all the cars, except they would have special routes for those who bring in food and you know, provide uh, uh, what's needed for the people. Uh, and ban all the cars, absolutely every car. I would plant trees in most of the streets in the middle of the day. I would bring, get some wild animals, <laughs> like tigers, a lot of snakes. The more poisonous, the better. Let them in, in, in there so that people would a little bit feel a sense of reality. Uh, New York would change dramatically. Jonas Mekis, what joy, what joy. That was great. So there are, um, I just want to say that Suki just showed up, my good friend Suki, the painter, Suki Weston. Hi. There she is, hi. And um, with Molly Girl, her dog, which you can't see because she's on the floor. Shall we do a little thing? We still... yeah, so there she is, I got her. Oh, she just had a bath. Okay, good, good for her. So um, there are distinct stages in growth, but I experience them rather differently than the way they're portrayed by society. I feel that I was a child till I was 35 years old. Then from 35 to 57, I was young. And from 57 onward, I began to really live as myself, but it took all that time. My mentor in becoming was Quentin Crisp. It was from him that I began to understand that I had a right to design my life if I had the courage to accept my true self. And it was from Quentin that I began to consider at age 40 that I might one day become old and that it would take preparation. And Quentin Chris became my role model in aging and in the business of becoming. So Quentin Crisp was, of course, English. Many of you may know him. Uh, he wrote the book, The um, Naked Civil Servant, which was his autobiography in like 19, I think 1973 or four, it, or 72. It was not successful at all. But it was then made into a BBC, oh, it wasn't BBC, I think it was Granada uh, uh, film, uh, made for TV movie. And it was so excellently done that it transcended television and became cinema. And the conversation on homosexuality entered into the world. And it was shown on PBS in America. And really, I believe that the two hallmarks of gay liberation were the Stonewall riot and the big ones. I mean, obviously there were other smaller ones and everything led, led to something, right? Everything leads to something. Nothing happens in a vacuum. But I believe that uh, in the 70s, it was the um, Stonewall riot and the film about Quentin, The Naked Civil Servant. And if you wonder about the title, the title comes from Quentin's job. And Quentin was an artist model. That was something that Quentin and I had in common. We had a lot of things in common. You want to know what they are? Well, we both changed our names. We were both artist models. We both 
wanted more than anything to know that if we were really, really, really ourselves, what would we be like? And there are a bunch of other things that we have in common. So um, I met Quentin in 1981 when I came back to New York. I think he had moved to New York in, um, oops, I think he had moved to New York uh, around 1979 or 1980. And I remember seeing him on the street and he had like, you know, lavender hair and, you know, he had these like big slouchy hats and, you know, looked quite um, the dandy. And I remember walking down the street and saying to somebody who I was with, and I don't remember who it was anymore. It was a gay guy for sure. And I said, who's that? And he said, oh, that's Quentin Crisp, the famous homosexual. And I said, that's it? He's just famous for being gay, you know, which I thought was kind of absurd being like a lifelong, you know, fag hag. You know, I didn't understand. And I, I hadn't seen the movie and didn't, hadn't read the book. <clears throat> and slowly over the early 80s, I started to get to know him, mainly by ending up at events with him. And um, by 1988, he and I started to become close. And I just, just couldn't believe, you know, I mean, I've always loved original thought more than anything. I love the brilliance of the human mind, of the unique human mind, the, the brilliance of a, of a unique take on things. And, um, and, and that everyone is capable of that if they will only just trust themselves. So uh, Quentin chose me as the woman he most identified with in 1991. And uh, there's a famous photograph of the two of us that the uh, London, uh, what is it called now? The London, I'm not gonna remember, Steve will remember. It's a ma Sunday magazine. Uh, they did. <laughs> it's a great photo because, you know, Quentin asked me if I'd be photographed with him. So I went there, you know, and kind of wore this kind of, I think it was a, um, a black, um, oh my God, you know, I'm tired. I'm tired because I'm taking care of this baby and getting up early. I never get up in the morning. Um, my little niece, my great niece, Mia. Mia Lorraine Rose Vosburg is just turned three months old. So I've been doing this morning thing. So now I'm getting tired and, you know, now I'm improvising and, um, and I'm not doing, I'm not having great clarity, but uh, the London Sunday magazine of, of the Telegraph, the London Telegraph, that's it. Here we go. Penny always comes around. Um, and they asked me if I had a change of, of clothes. And of course I didn't, you know, I just wore this, um, this suit. Oh, are you here? Who's, who's the famous New York designer who had a store on 54th street? Molly? Yes. Thank God for Suki. Oh, Suki and I have adjoining brains. <laughs> so I had this Norma Kamali suit, black suit. And I didn't know what to do when they asked me, did I have another outfit? And I just took off the jacket. And I was like in this black bra with this severe skirt. And it was, it's a great photograph. Anyways, that's the one they used. And um, so we have a wonderful uh, um, video from a live performance that we did, Quentin and I did many performances together, but we had one really great one that we did uh, that Steve not only ran the show, Steve Zetner, I'm giving you a little plug here. Now, to give you an idea of my work with Steve Zetner, not only did he run the show in a 1700 seat theater in Vienna, Mozart's theater, imagine, and we had just gotten there. We got there like the day before. I came from India and Steve came from New York with Quentin. And Steve not only ran the show technically, which was pretty much improvised questions on my part, uh, but he also taped the show. And we have what 
Steve made out of a two and a half hour performance, he made a one hour film. And you can watch that on our Patreon. So for now, I will say this to you, that when I became friends with Quentin, and I really became friends with him when I was 40, and he's twice my age, and a little bit, actually, a little bit more. He's born in 1909, and I'm born in 1950. Hello. Hello. And he was the youngest person I knew. And it was just amazing for me to understand that in a way we get younger, we can become younger, not in our bodies, not in our faces, et cetera, but internally in our hearts, our hearts become younger. So becoming friends with Quentin at 40, really friends with him at 40, I started to realize that one day I would be old and that this would take preparation. And Quentin became my role model in aging and in the business we're all in, which is what he called the business of becoming. So here, please meet Quentin Crisp. To a lot of people all over the world, they think that you invented homosexuality. <laughs> Well, I didn't invent it, I codified it. <laughs> well, when I was young, yes, it is true, I thought that it's no good just writing books about homosexuality or producing films about it. Someone has to do it. They someone have to live it. Someone has to live it. So that when you see me, walking along Fulham Road, you'd think, there's one. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be doing any harm, nothing. And you think, they must have a life. They can't always be in drag, in clubs. They must live. Because they would see you taking your laundry. Yeah. Buying a tomato. Mm. And you thought that if they saw you, that they would get used to the idea. Well, they noticed me, but they didn't get used to me. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't work, but that's what I thought. But then, of course, young people long to have a, a cause, a gesture. And really, I was only doing it for myself. But still, all over the world, people consider you to be the first gay activist. They feel that the life that you lived, that you um, suffered and you were visible. And I mean, I think the two things that people choose as hallmarks of the gay liberation movement is one, Quentin Crisp, and then two, the Stonewall riots. When did you come out? Well, I was never in. <laughs> so. And every closet door I opened, the people were, were standing room only inside, and they said, not in here. <laughs> so I, I was out. My favorite thing that you say, this is so good, because he may not just say it on his own, even a marriage to oneself. That was Oscar Wilde. He said, to love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong relationship. But you say even a marriage to oneself may not last forever. forever. <laughs> That's right. Has your relationship gone on with yourself? Or did it stop 10 years ago, but you're still living together? That's right. I find it sad that you don't believe in romantic love. And most of us have so much trouble being in a relationship and maintaining a relationship, and yet... But most... why do you do it? Because we want to be happy. Oh, happiness is never in other people. Happiness is never out there. Happiness is in here. I understand that, but then when you're happy in here, then you want to share it with someone who is preferably out there. Never share anything. <laughs> As I got to know Quentin, I started to experience you as a kind of Zen monk. 
Yes, as a Zen monk, because you were saying that、um, one must take the journey within, and that it wasn't an altogether pleasant experience, but that you must go in and you must see who you are in order. I thought to be happy. That you have to do that in order to develop your style. <laughs> Is it possible then that you are as shallow as many people think you are? Oh, more! You're more shallow. Yeah. Your sh- your shallowness is deeper. <laughs> I'm deeply shallow. <laughs> Let's talk about fashion. Well, fashion is instead of style. When you don't know who you are. Then you consult the glossy magazines, and then you learn what to wear. And all we know when we see you coming down the street is that you had enough money to buy Vanity Fair. We don't know anything about you because you look like everybody else. But I wear clothes which I think tell the world who I think I am. Nobody ever talks to me about the weather. Ah, <laughs>、oh, Quentin. Well, in 1992, at the same time as I was becoming very close to Quentin. And spending a lot of time with him doing special performances with Quentin, I met a woman who would have an enormous impact on how I would approach the last decades of my life, and that person was Betty Dodson, artist and sex educator. Betty was independent and outspoken, and although I had known of Betty's work with women and masturbation since 1981. It wasn't until 1992 when I met Betty during our run of my sex and censorship show, "Bitch Dyke Fag Hag Whore" at the Village Gate, which was also the first show that I did with Steve Zettner. Betty and I clicked immediately, as Betty was forthright and among the strongest, most singular people I'd ever met. Her self-acceptance. Made a huge impact on me, as did her singular honesty, which somehow managed to tell the truth without bitterness, for the lack of support her work had always received. Extraordinarily, before her death in 2020, she would live to see her ideas put forward to the world in the widest mainstream way possible. During an episode dedicated to her and her work from the unlikeliest quarter, Gwyneth Paltrow's "Goop" on Netflix. When I spoke to Betty shortly before she died, she said, "Penny, come and see me, so I can tell you how to prepare to be famous when you're ninety." When I interviewed Betty in 1999 for the Lower East Side Biography Project, she was the age I am right now, 70. So let me introduce you to Betty Dodson. I started watching all the movies that were shot in New York, and I'd sit there and I'd look. Yeah. Wonderful. So I, so when, did. when did you? 1950. The year I was born. I love that. So it's the year we were both born. Yeah, but it's very, it's very true though, because a lot of amazing people came to New York in 1950. Andy Warhol came in 1950. Jack Smith came in 1950. Tell us about it. Well, they say that you know, 50s New York was so different than now. I loved it then. I love it now. New York represents freedom. And that's what it it represented to me, all along. The first year I was here, I moved so much I lost track. But I was on in the West Twenties, over by the park in the Seventies, West End Avenue, 
I was down in the village. I finally got into my art studio over on West 29th Street. And I had that for 13 years. And then I got married. I was 35 and uh, my husband came home one night and he said he was gonna take up golf and I said, great, I'm taking up sex. And it was a joke and we both laughed and a month later he was, he was, we were divorced and he was playing golf and I was having sex. I'd spent all my childhood and teenage and 20s masturbating with my clitoris and when it came to partner sex, it was fucking only. Do you get, do you get this? I think it's called schizophrenia. What, what would you say? It, it was outrageous. I never got the two together until I was 35. And that's when I said, oh, well, let me share the good news. I mean, I'd already read Betty Friedan, and I loved her. I still do. That was the book that really I went, whoa. Oh, the feminine mystique. Of course, it turned out to be, you know, sex roles and other things. And, the, it, you know, you had to, de to develop her theme. And um, she didn't deal much with sexuality, but uh, I did. And I just, it, to me, it was the most meaningful thing that ever happened to me. It was the most wonderful thing and also the most horrible thing. How? Oh. Because it was such a disappointment. I really thought we were going to get it together and we were going to change the world. Tell, tell me a little bit Well, about that. I go barrel ass and into feminism, you know, with my ideas of liberating masturbation. And the woman, women say, I, I don't want to masturbate. I want to have, I want to fall in love and live with the man of my dreams and, and live happily ever after. They wanted the romantic dream. They didn't want to have to learn practical skills or speak what, you know, they didn't want to play that game. They wanted to be sleeping beauties and princesses and fall into love and, and have the romantic dream. So I was just, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 <laughs> it was just going on in that one day, yeah, they don't know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have multiple partners, I don't want to do myself, I don't want to do my own clitoris during intercourse, it's his job. I think a lot of that still exists today, it's his job. So that means I'm supposed to look beautiful, lie there, and the poor guy's got to do everything. He has to turn me on, get me in front of an orgasm, get me over the orgasm, hold back on his orgasm. Then, then he comes, and then he has to pick up the tab f for dinner and pay the rent. That's not a good deal. What is the woman doing? He's complaining, not coming, bad, moping, dragging her feet. It's not what she wants. Her dream didn't turn out. <laughs> We're our own worst enemies. Brilliant. How brilliant, how brilliant is Betty Dodson, I ask you. You know, now a lot of people wouldn't like what she has to say because it's too true. Okay, so we have come to the end of my presentation. And now let's hear from Alona, Aliona, if there's any questions anybody had and I'll answer them. And it's been really wonderful to spend this time with you. I really, oh, I so enjoyed seeing these people again. So wonderful.